All right, so everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Guy Royce. Uh, I'm the self-proclaimed czar of the Columbus JavaScript user group. We don't have any fancy graphics or anything. We're just using Zoom here. Um, and you can see that we've got uh, several folks here with us on stream. Uh, you see lots of uh, Brady Bunch-like faces. So um, yeah, uh, welcome. So here's, uh, we got tonight, we've got Matt Allen uh, Land. Uh, how, do, how do you say your name, Matt? I'm, I'm butchering it, ain't I? It's fine, it's Eland. Eland. That's a way different than I said. <laughs> you would have gotten to it eventually. Are, are you sure that's right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Matt's going to be speaking. What's, what's your talk tonight? Uh, I'm going to be talking about building an interactive fiction game in modern JavaScript. That sounds like a lot of fun. I've been working on something similar as a hobby for most of my adult life. Um, so um, just a little bit of, um, I guess, a guideline or information on how this is going to work. Uh, there's some of you on stream on Twitch. Uh, that's fantastic. We, we like people on Twitch. Uh, and some of us are here in the Zoom. If you've got questions and you're on the Zoom, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask them. I mean, at an appropriate, socially appropriate time, right? You know, if Matt says, so are there any questions? Then you can unmute yourself. Or if there's just a, a, a long pause or something like that, right? Uh, we're adults. We, we know how to behave. Um, if you uh, don't have a window for that, or uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, feel free to put your question in chat in the Zoom as well um, and uh, ask it there. And uh, I'll be monitoring chat and we'll uh, make sure that Matt sees it. I think Matt's probably gonna be trying to watch chat too. Um, so uh, we'll try to get to those questions then and we'll certainly get to them at the end. We'll have a little Q and A session at the end. Uh, if you're on Zoom, or I mean, if you're on Twitch and you're not in the Zoom, uh, the Zoom link is available on the meetup if you wanna join us. Um, at, uh, at, uh, you can go to columbusjs.org uh, and find all the links that you need. Um, but if uh, you also, if you want to just, I'm, I'm over here looking at Zoom now, or at, at Twitch now. Um, I have it on another monitor. But uh, if you have questions, just feel free to put those in the chat in uh, Twitch as well, and I'll be monitoring that. So um, that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, sure. go ahead and kick off with your presentation? The floor is yours, Matt. Uh, sounds good. Thank you, Guy. Um, so I am uh, Matt Eland, as, uh, as Guy Royce uh, said. Um, I've been in Columbus for about uh, 18 years by now. Um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about how to build an interactive fiction game in modern, modern JavaScript. Um, this is more of a uh, you can do something than a step-by-step you know, -step how do you do something kind of a talk. Uh, this is also one of the more informal talks that I'm going to give. So uh, as Guy said, please you know, interrupt, ask questions. Uh, I don't mind. It's uh, really the second most informal talk I give. <laughs> so <laughs> um, please follow me on, on Twitter at IntegerMan. I, I talk a lot of tech technology up, up there and uh, always love to have more people to talk to. Uh, I'm an instructor at Tech Elevator in Columbus, uh, where I'm uh, a .NET, JavaScript, and uh, occasionally Java instructor. Um, we do 14 week uh, coding boot camps, a uh, very intensive kind of program. Have a number of graduates and current students in the in, in chat as well, which is kind of cool too. Uh, before that, I was a, uh, if I give the proper window focus, uh, I was a you know, software engineer for probably about 20 years and a software engineering manager uh, for a couple of years as well. Um, but I did a lot of .NET technologies. I've been doing really C Sharp since uh, beta two of that technology back in 2001. And I like to say that I've been doing uh, JavaScript technologies since it became fun to do JavaScript, which was maybe around ES5 for me. Uh, but your mileage may vary in the JavaScript world. Um, do a lot of uh, application development and um, that kind of became Angular and now Vue.js. Uh, so talking tonight a little bit more about, uh, about Angular. Um, so some, fa some fun facts about me. Um, I am a husband. Um, you may not notice this, but I am slightly a nerd, ever so slightly. Um, I am also a terrier owner, and that's going to be important in a minute because, oh, well, this is Jester, uh, my uh, three-year-old Cairn Terrier, like Toto from Wizard of Oz. Uh, but I'm going to be talking to you today, just kind of a project talk about a game I made recently called uh, Doggo Quest, you know, a very serious name, a uh, very serious game. <laughs> um, and, and this is a bit of a, a whimsical talk a little bit, um, but uh, it's really to get the most out of this talk, um, you should really know some of JavaScript, you know, be interested in JavaScript development, single page application development, 
you know, be curious about side projects and maybe some uh, text parsing and uh, just uh, natural language pro uh, parsing as well. Um, but if you only have a, a little bit of, a, of uh, familiarity with software development, you'll probably still get some fun things from this talk. Um, so my goals for you are really to, you know, have fun, uh, learn about some new things, uh, such as text parsing libraries, Angular, uh, different development mythologies, um, and just consider hobby projects and what you can build. Um, again, this is very informal, so feel free to, you know, ask questions. I'm not going to be going very deep on any one thing. So if there's something that I'm talking about or may talk about that is interesting to you, uh, just please let me know and I'll try to drill into it and, you know, you kind of get some, some custom mileage out of this. Um, so before we get any further, I should mention that I, I consider Doggo Quest to be a failure. Uh, and it's very interesting to be giving a talk about a project that I'm not actually all that proud of, uh, both the code and the, like the final output. Uh, but I, I think it's still educational, uh, both in the terms of what I'm going to be covering today, as well as just that it's not complete uh, because most side projects don't get completed in my experience. Um, and the leading cause of failure in this one for me really wasn't anything technical, uh, but it was this uh, nasty little thing called coronavirus, right? So, you know, I was kind of trucking along on this thing and I was doing well, and then two big things happened. Uh, one was the world kind of shut down with coronavirus. And the other one was, you know, I left development and got into, uh, got into teaching and mentoring. And so my, my focus really kind of shifted very suddenly. Um, and with, with COVID-19 in particular, my energy changed a lot in the evenings. So instead of spending my time developing and working on this project, I was spending more of it either, you know, learning more about Vue.js or, or things I wanted to teach or honestly just self-care, like uh, keeping my emotions healthy, um, unwinding a little bit with some mod of Minecraft or or reading or, you know, YouTube or whatever it was. Um, and I, I think it's okay to be open with about that. And I think uh, COVID-19 impacts all of us at least a little bit, and it's okay to talk about that. So I want to be open about that, but I still think that we're going to learn some interesting things tonight. Um, so happy to share with you. Uh, now, probably most of you have not heard the term interactive fiction or are not familiar with what it means. So let me just kind of introduce that to you. Um, so back in the day, uh, there was this uh, game called Zork. And there were some games before it, but Zork is really the most famous example of interactive fiction. Um, and and you, it's kind of like a command, command line application. So you get like this description of where you are and what you see, and this little prompt that says, what, what, what do you want to do, right? Um, and you type in, uh, open the mailbox. And then it would say, you open the mailbox, there's a leaflet inside and uh, you get a paper cut or something like that. And then you type, you know, smell the, uh, smell the note. And it says, you don't see a note here. It's like, okay, well, how do you want to spell note? And so, so they were very frustrating games, but they were games and they were early games. And um, they had kind of this concept, like a geographical concept of rooms. So each area in the game might be a room. So you might be in a hallway or in an office and there might be a, a note there or a desk chair and you know, things like that. And you can kind of navigate between rooms by going north and south. And uh, the games didn't usually come with these maps and players would just kind of have to keep track of them uh, often by dropping objects and seeing what objects remained when they went in which directions. Uh, mazes were pretty common in early games as well. Um, this will be important in a bit. Uh, now, interactive fiction or text-based games sort of went away as computers matured and they were replaced more by graphical adventure games. Uh, and this is important to me because my, some of my earliest memories of the personal computer were sitting on my cousin's lap and watching her play King's Quest, which is uh, pictured here, one of the early King's Quest games. Uh, and you see, we still have like the same, like we, we see the same house and we see the mailbox. Um, and they had a, te a text parser at the bottom. So you type in what you wanted to do. So open the mailbox and it says, you're not close enough to the mailbox. And so you move your guy a little closer and then you open the mailbox and it says, you don't see a mailbox here and you get frustrated. But you know, it was the gaming experience back in the eighties and that was fine. Um, and these games were really big. They'd have a lot of different screens and you could move around them um, and they could tell stories. And that was really cool to me as a kid. And so I got really interested in computers and computer programming as a kid and uh, computer gaming and building games and things like that. 
in fact, I can tell you the exact moment that I decided that I wanted to be a professional software engineer. Uh, and that was when I was playing, and I had already been doing programming at this time, but I've been playing a game in the Sierra, Sierra series called Space Quest 3. And there's this screen near the end of the game. We we're going through this, this uh, company called Scumsoft, I believe it was. And um, there's a whole bunch of programmers who are basically pirating games. And these, these two guys walking down the gangplanks and they're flogging these programmers. And for whatever reason in my, you know, grade school brain, seeing the screen, I just said, you know what? I want to be those guys, not the guys with the whips, the guys, the cubicles. So I'm not sure what was going on. Uh, but uh, for me, you know, that was like, okay, let's, let's, let's do that. So, you know, I do have some questions uh, for, for childhood Matt. Um, but it worked out pretty well, so I'm not, I'm not too uh, I'm not too disappointed about that choice. Um, and once I started learning more about uh, once I started more learning more about uh, programming, you know, I wanted to build my own games. And you know, I can't make something like this. And so, Hello World for me became building something like Zork. You know, making something very simple where it describes a room where you are typing in things, moving around. And so I built something like that in QBasic. And then I learned Turbo Pascal and I built something like that in Turbo Pascal. And then I learned C and C++ and I built something like that in those languages and VB.net and C Sharp. And, uh, and I hadn't done it in probably six, seven, eight years, something like that. And I realized, wait a minute, I'm doing you know JavaScript application development. I built two or three large applications in Angular. I should really revisit this project because I've never did my Hello World application in it. Um, incidentally, if you're making a hello world application, probably just say hello world. Don't try to write a novel. Um, but those are other issues I have. <laughs> uh, so a couple years ago, I said, okay, well, let's make a text-based game in Angular. And so I, I made a, what I call Angular IF, which is really just an engine that presents, um, it gives you a web user interface where you can type in commands and you can get a response. And there's like about three screens. There's a kind of an, a common opera house demo that they have uh, engines implement in order to demonstrate their feasibility. And I, I got that working and it was pretty fun. Uh, and so I said, well, you know what? Let's, let's keep going with this. And so I said, let's, let's build a game. And well, I have trouble with scope if you're not uh, catching on to that. And so I decided to build something which I'm now calling scope creep the game. And every one of these is going to be like an interactive screen with like five or six objects and all this stuff. And I think I got, you know, maybe about this area implemented before I said, all of my time is going to content creation and not any of it to like an engine or building things or coding. This is, this is not anything fun. This is not like, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with how I'm spending my time on this. And so thankfully I decided to, to cancel that. Um, but uh I was thinking this year and I was like, you know what? I'd really like to be able to share something like this at a user group like this or a conference or something like that. So maybe let's dust off this project and, and, and see what lessons I can learn from it. Um, and I found that it, it was really strongly tied to Angular 6 and it no longer built for me for whatever reason. Um, and instead of trying to power through that, I decided, well, let's just make something small and something easy to demo and something fun. And so my goals were, you know, let's just make it fun, easy, and running entirely in uh, your browser. So you could do a text-based game in the browser uh, by having it making a request to a server, getting a response, and then rendering that response. That's uh, entirely valid. Um, I have a library for JavaScript uh, game development or text parsing that I really like uh, called NLP Compromise, uh, which I'll be talking about later. Uh, and so I made the choice to do everything just in the browser client side on the user's machine. And so I was looking for something that would be very small, uh, fun, and kind of easy to understand. And um, I kind of came across this, this idea from uh, when my, my dog was, uh, was just a puppy. And he kind of got loose one day. Like I went off to work and uh, I got to work and I had a notification from Nest that he had gotten out of his crate. And so I'm like, well, we have quarters laying around the house. He's still a puppy. He's going to go and eat those things. So uh, I drove back home and I checked on him and yeah, he messed up the house uh, all over the place, but he was still alive and healthy. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, so the idea of this, the, this project is you're the puppy, you're getting out of your crate and you're ransacking the house. You have a certain number of turns to just cause as much damage as possible to the house. That's the concept of the game. 
uh, I didn't implement the time limit. I didn't, uh, you know, you, you can't destroy as many things as you as, as I would like you to. But otherwise, you know, it's it's a decent prototype. Uh, and so that's that's Doggo Quest. Uh, again, very serious game, very serious title. Sorry, that's me. Uh, but uh, it's a very small game. It should have been smaller. It should have been about, you know, yay size. Instead, it's about yay size. Um, but that's okay. Um, so again, you know, I'm kind of hinting at, you know, scope is, a, it, it, it tends to spiral downhill pretty quickly. Uh, and here I've got about seven, eight rooms, something like that. And then I have maybe three or four objects per room and you have certain verbs that support. So you can look at things, sniff them, chew on them, lick them, push them, you know, that kind of thing. And so you kind of do the math and it's like, okay, well, I have to support about 150 different operations at least just to describe things, not even like interactivity. Um, so th that was something that took the winds out of my sails a little bit on the project, uh, but I powered through most of it. Uh, but let's talk about more of the code and the process because I think that's that's really interesting and something that you all can, can learn from. Um, one of the things I really like with single page application development, whether it's React or Angular or Vue.js, uh, is just kind of prototyping. And nowadays people uh, tend to use Figma, uh, but I'm still a little bit old school and I like this tool called Balsamic uh, with a Q because they're cute. Uh, and I use the, their shapes to kind of build this little thing. So I got a, like a little wireframe browser and then just sort of like the page structure. And like, this is my prototype of it. Like you got a header with a score, you got some form of text, a player command, more text, a scroll bar, and then kind of a command area. So that's, that's essentially what the, the project should look like, right? But prototyping on, on an Angular or other type of spa is really cool because you can look at that and say, okay, I'm going to break this thing down into regions. So I might have a master app component, which was like the whole thing, like this is the entire game, but then I can start to subdivide this and this is composed of other components. So the app component has a header, it has a kind of a command entry uh, component, it's got a story view. And the story view is composed of other components. It's got a player in command component, and it's got, uh, you know, maybe multiple story entry components. These are just like the system's response to you. So you kind of come up with like a, a kind of a, a sketch that you're happy with uh, without a whole lot of detail. And B, you have a list of components that you want to create. And then what you can do is you can go into, uh, in my case, Angular, and I can kind of pretty quickly generate new components. So in Angular, you can type in the command line. You can say ng, which is Angular, um, g, which is short for generate, c, which is short for component. So Angular, build me a component named command entry, right? And it will create the it, like all the files that you need for that. And then you'll just be able to go in there and uh, kind of custom wire up your own user interface, your own logic, um, your own styles of choice. Um, and this little stories thing, which I'll talk about later. Uh, Angular actually didn't create that for me. I just included it in the screenshot. That's uh, something I added later. Um, but uh, probably good to tell, talk a little bit about Angular for those who aren't familiar with it. So. The first thing I like to say about Angular is that it's not Angular JS because that's the number one thing people tend to confuse, uh, including recruiters, which is really annoying. Also including people in human resources writing job descriptions, which is even more annoying. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Angular is really the su uh, successor to Angular JS, so it's Angular 2. And so anything Angular 2 and above, we just call Angular and Angular 1 is Angular JS. It's just very different. They kind of rewrote it for Angular 2 and took a long time about it too. Uh, but Google wrote it and um, they, as opposed to like um, Vue.js and React, which call themselves libraries, uh, they say, no, we're a framework. We, 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 are, we are intended to be an entire application. Uh, so you should, you should follow our opinions and patterns and processes. And this is how you should build your applications. Um, so their opinions are are kind of forced upon you. I, I happen to think that they're mostly good ones. Uh, they are somewhat tweakable. Uh, yeah, your mileage may vary. I see your head movements there. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
I, I do like their, their opinions. So some of those opinions are saying that they are married to TypeScript. So you, instead of using JavaScript files, they're using TypeScript files. We'll talk about TypeScript more in a second. Uh, secondly, they give you dependency injection out of the box so you can really easily link things together. I think that's pretty cool for a larger and scalable application. Um, and, and then it has like certain numbers of kind of common building blocks. So they have components, which are kind of visual regions of your web page, uh, services, which are um, classes designed to provide common services, such as maybe calling out to an external API, showing a message box, logging, something like that, right? Modules sort of link everything together, maybe make your application progressively downloadable if you don't want to download it all in once. Uh, and then they have some lesser used but powerful things called like directives, guards, filters, things like that. Um, I've recently learned Vue.js. I will say that Angular is extremely familiar, uh, extremely similar to it. Um, I think that Vue.js is much easier to learn. Uh, Angular is maybe more intended for larger applications, while Vue is, is intended more for smaller applications. But Vue has plenty of things that you can bolt onto it to make it suitable for larger applications. So uh, whichever works for you, I would say go and do it. Uh, and I haven't done work with React, so I can't really talk too much about it. Um, my understanding of React is really that it's it's much more suited for people who are coming from a model view controller kind of a background, while uh, Angular and Vue.js might be more suited for people from a model view view model um, background. Um, but all of these these frameworks have kind of very similar workflows. Um, so um, let's talk about TypeScript, I guess. So TypeScript uh, used to be my my best friend forever. I'm still pretty happy with it, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm starting to see some advantages of just raw JavaScript. But for those of you not familiar with TypeScript, uh, you write your code in a .ts file instead of a .js file, uh, and that can include type annotations. So you're saying that your method would return a string or a Boolean or a number or something like that. And your parameters can also have these same type annotations. And TypeScript has this thing called the TSC or the TypeScript compiler, and it takes your, your TypeScript files and it turns them into JavaScript uh, files. And it will check. It will say like, hey, you didn't call this thing with enough parameters, or you gave me the wrong parameter type. And it'll catch errors for you at compile time. The most common misconception I see about TypeScript is that it enforces type safety at runtime. It really doesn't. It's only at compile time. Um, but I've also seen teams that really, really, really needed something to catch uh, <laughs> uh, type safety. Um, and, and TypeScript has been fantastic for that. Now that said, when I've been working with Vue, I've actually found myself really wanting to do more of just JavaScript and less of TypeScript, which is something I'm still exploring why I like that, but uh, uh, stay tuned. But that's really a TypeScript in a nutshell and Angular will take care of that automatically for you just from uh, how it's set up. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about Angular is that there's a user interface library kind of com commonly associated with Angular called Angular Material, uh, which really gives you a lot of Google's material design that they use for Android, um, kind of bolted on uh, just off the shelf. So these things like these, uh, these little regions and uh, headers and like kind of text areas and labels and things like that, you get it kind of out of the box without having to do a whole lot of custom styling. I did do like a style tweak for this, um, but that's really just to have a dark theme with a blue accent color. And I think that was about it. Uh, so we'll see some Angular code in a minute and I'll highlight some of the Angular material uh, tags, um, but uh, we're not gonna get too much in depth into, into that today. I just want you to know that it's there and I used it to really accelerate my prototyping process. Um, I also use this thing on the user interface side called Storybook. And Storybook is, is uh, it's not mar married to Angular or any other framework. It just really exists to give you a way to uh, test each one of your components in isolation. Um, and that's really helpful for developers and larger applications, but it's also helpful for project managers or quality assurance or, or somebody like that, a business analyst, someone who needs to be able to look at something and quickly say, okay, is this component still working right after we made our changes? Does this meet our needs? Um, what does this look like if I give it a message like this? You know, um, So it helps teams on larger projects is my experience. Um, mine was just you know me in the evenings, but uh, I still thought it was fun and uh, it helped me out a little bit on some things. 
Um, but it's a pretty cool technology and you can bolt on things to that as well. Like uh, these, these little knobs, which I'll show you in a second are uh, an add on to it. And it also has accessibility uh, testing um, bolted on as well, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to move into uh, kind of a, a demo just of, uh, well, of, of this game, <laughs> as well as uh, uh, the front end aspects of it. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the code uh, for the, the parsing uh, after this demo, because really I separated this into sort of Angular and then the story handling logic, just so it wouldn't be tied to one specific framework if I wanted to switch, shift it over to Vue.js in the future, which hint, I, I, I do just for fun. Uh, so have any questions, this is a great time for it, but I'm going to kind of move into the, uh, actually I'll start with the demo of the code or of the application. So this hey, is Bob. Uh, hey, Matt. Yeah, what you got, Joel? Um, so um, obviously, I don't know much about JS and uh, well, JS a little bit. But what if it converts? If uh, TS just takes your files and converts it to JavaScript, what's the advantage of TypeScript? Is it just a little bit easier to use? A little bit more intuitive? Does it give you more capabilities? More flexibility? For me, it was easier to learn JavaScript from a, a like a static language background because it, it lets you use um, features which weren't present in all modern browsers yet, which was nice. Um, but it, it, the main thing it gives you is the static type checking. So you can say like, oh, I, I'm trying to, to put a string into a Boolean in a parameter here or whatever. It's just another safety net uh, and another headache that you have to deal with. So it's a, it's a trade-off like many things in software development. And if I may add, VS Code allows you to do extensive completion if you have that enabled. So mm. you don't even necessarily have to remember what you can put in in a given place. Yeah, the TypeScript language service is awesome. Uh, WebStorm does the same thing. I tend to do more more uh, TypeScript development in WebStorm, but uh, absolutely yes. Uh, who uh, who developed TypeScript? Microsoft. Yeah, it took me a minute. <laughs> I'm the Microsoft guy. I should I should know that. Um, but yeah, Microsoft did. It sounds the way you described it was sounding like that, but cool. <laughs> I do drink the Kool Aid, but uh, I've um, I don't know. I don't think of Microsoft when I think of TypeScript. I just uh, I just like it. Um, so this is a uh, dogglequest.com. You can go with it and uh, play around with it if you'd like. Uh, but I'm just going to show you a few commands and uh, kind of give you a sense of of what this thing is that I'm talking about. Uh, so in crate, you're in your crate yet again. It's small and and not quite large enough for you to rest comfortably. Uh, there's a blanket on the floor and a door to the crate in front of you. You don't like it in here. So I can type smell the blanket, hit enter. It says it smells like you. Well, that's, that's great. Chew on the blanket. So it's telling me it's handling it as the eat verb instead of chew. That's kind of a nuance of my engine. I think that's something I'd probably like to hide at some point. Um, it says you would never want to hurt your precious blanket. Um, and kind of a little debug aid for me. I have, uh, this is actually expandable. So I can look in here and it's kind of hard to read this size. So let's just enhance a little bit. Um, so we see the words that it parsed. It says chew. It says that's an infinitive present tense verb. Okay, blanket. Well, that's a noun. It's singular and it's mapped. I'll talk more about what mapped means in a bit. Um, and it it's, has a couple words associated with it too. It has the and on, which are determiners and prepositions. So you can see sort of the engine's view of this sentence that the player typed in. Uh, if I typed in something kind of weird, like um, I am the Batman, it tells me your command must start with a verb. For example, bark at the squirrel. Um, this is really to constrain the scope of what it has to process um, so that it's it's not having to handle all sorts of complex English. It's more just imperative sentences. Um, and I, if I type in eat the door while drinking soda, Okay, I guess it handled that. Uh, I thought it would be telling me that I have two verbs in that sentence. Uh, eat, door, and drink soda. Yeah, here we go. So I guess it had some some issues with the ing suffix there. Um, 
but it says your command uh, cannot have more than one verb. So high level, that's, that's sort of the, the main restrictions I, I place on the engine. But I can say, push the door. And it says, you push the door and it flies open. You are free. Your score has gone up by one point. We see in the upper right, my score is now one. It's like, great. All right, so go out of crate. As you go out, the office is a small area where mommy likes to do some of her work. She's not here, so the only things of interest are your crate to the south and a rocking chair overlooking a window. The rest of the house is to the east. So very minimal descriptions, just sort of guiding you as to what's available. Uh, so I'm gonna be a good dog and chew the chair. You grab hold of the chair's padding and rip it to shreds. Fluff flies everywhere. That was fantastic. Your score has gone up by one, and you see our scores now too. So, in a nutshell, that's Doggo Quest, right? A little dog gets gets loose and uh, causes mayhem. Um, I was uh, I was uh, going to uh, I was mentioning Storybook earlier. So while I'm in my browser, I will share that. Um, so Storybook has. Uh, sort of components to it. So here we have the header component uh, and it has Doggo Quest over here and it has this little score knob. So I can take, make this thing 500, right? And it updates it in real time. So my product manager can see what happens if I type in, you know, whatever I want in there uh, and, and how it responds to that. I guess a, a, a negative or a non-existent score isn't credible. I can click on accessibilities and it tells me, hey, there's there's no, easily detectable accessibility issues with this. Um, <coughs> I'm seeing Matt saying that apparently turn off the camera has uh, has two verbs in it. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. There were some hiccups with uh, NLP compromise this time that I didn't bump into two years ago. Um, so I can also look at like other components in here. So the application, I can look at uh, story entries so I can change this thing to an error and saying, I need to think of something to type. You know, uh, so it's just really easy way to uh, kind of show the capabilities of your application. Um, so that's Storybook in a nutshell. If you have any story or any questions on it, uh, let me know. I'm gonna get into the code for this in a second. Um, I'm also going to be kind of showing you some Angular code. So here is um, uh, here is the Angular for the the uh, header. So the thing that says your score is 42 or whatever. So we see we we have a mat toolbar tag that anything mat m a t dash is a uh, Angular material. Uh, so my kind of UI library, um, and this kind of has some. Uh, expectations on formatting. Uh, if you look at the documentation on the Angular Material website, um, is they really kind of expect a span and then another span with a class of spacer and then another span in order to really get the effect that I was looking for. Uh, but you see here I have this, you know, I have doggo quest here, so that's kind of static text. But over here I have score equals, uh, well, score colon and then squiggly's score. Uh, so this is telling me that it's a binding to a score property. The score property is defined on the component associated with it, so the header component, um, which is a class in TypeScript. And we see here I have um, a, a score that's defined as an input, so we can pass it into the component if we wanted to, and it's public so we can set it. Um, and so this is really what it's binding to. Uh, we also see we have a constructor here that takes in a story service and it will grab the score out of the, the service on construction. And then it subscribes to an entries added event on that. And it unsubscribes when this component is unloaded. So anytime the entries added event fires, the, uh, uh, the story service uh, score is set back into score here and the user interface will, will update. So kind of like a, a two-way, uh, a two-way binding kind of a thing, if that makes sense. Um, we also have a styles.scss file for if we wanted to do any custom styling here. I don't tend to typically like to do things at the component level. I like to more share application-wide styles, but your your, your mileage may vary. 
Um, and then the stories.cs, or sorry, ts file, <laughs> too much.net. Um, we have some imports uh, from Storybook. If this thing would stop bouncing me down. Um, or we say stories of a header, like that's the, um, that's the major grouping that we had. Uh, and then I, I give it some decorators. So I give it my application module, which lets it get all my other stylings and uh, injections and things like that. And then I have a with ally, so with accessibility. Uh, that gives me my accessibility add-on, which I've configured elsewhere. Uh, and then I have like a with knobs, which gives me the knobs uh, add-on, which I've configured elsewhere. And then I have kind of different variants. So I have a score zero variant here uh, that just says like, hey, I want you to render the header component and you're gonna have a score of zero. And I have a score 10,000 that has, a, has this. So these will show up if I go back into the, into the website here, score zero and score 10,000. Um, but if I go over here to my um, configurable one, um, we see we have score is number method call with a title of score and the, the value of 42. So this is saying, give me a knob. Oh, come on. Uh, give me a knob for a uh, score that the user can adjust and default it to 42. And that knob is going to have a number in it. Um, so this, this is kind of a, a, how you would set that up at a high level, um, just as far as storybook goes. Um, any questions on the front end of this? It really is very, um, like a very shallow front end. It's, it's very much just styling and uh, handling player commands and sending them off to this story service thing, which then talks to the, uh, the TypeScript library. Hey, hey, Matt. Yeah. Seems like you had to build basically all your own libraries. Did you... Are you building your own and then also using some that Mark that .NET gave you? Uh, no, I'm not doing any .NET here. Um, what do you, wh which libraries are you talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm probably just using libraries incorrectly. Just it seems like you're building stuff elsewhere and then bringing it in. Um, yeah, you probably just, is, is it just classes and namespaces and things? Uh, yeah, I see what you're talking about with these import statements. Um, yeah, I, I'm importing things from Storybook here. Uh, so I installed the Storybook package into my application. Um, and uh, then uh, the rest of these two are actually from my, uh, from my application itself. So this relative path here tells me where to find the app module. And this path here tells me where to find the header component. But everything else is just from having installed Storybook into my, my project. Um, and Matt, if you could uh, zoom in a little bit, just uh, give us a little bit bigger text, that'd be great. Yeah, you know, I'm not actually all that used to uh, to VS Code. Uh, for the future, there's a nice extension for VS Code that enables presentation mode. And it's, it's actually, I think there's a couple now, but. Um, plus, by the way. Yeah, I'm not finding it, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll have to take a look for, uh, for that. Uh, uh, most just, of my uh, time I'm using a uh, web storm, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, oh, uh, it should be control plus or command plus to increase your, uh, there you go. Yeah, there we go. We've enhanced now. Sorry about that. So there's storybook. Um, if you want, I'll go back and show you header uh, with that as well. Sure. sure. There's the, the header, just very simple, not a whole lot in there. And then the, the code behind. Uh, and these yellow ones here are the kind of angular events. So when the, pay, when the component is initialized or destroyed, uh, so loaded and unloaded, really. And then everything else is just sort of properties and maintenance. Okay, so I'm going to get back into uh, into it and start. We'll talk, start talking about the the really fun stuff, which is uh, just kind of how the story content works, how the text processing uh, processing works. So I mentioned the map, right? Uh, so we have a number of room, rooms here, um, and uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I have a number of rooms here. 
and each room is defined as a TypeScript class. So we have a crate uh, room here that extends from my room base. So it's a room. It has a couple of directions. So north goes to the office and out also goes to the office because the user might try to type either one of those. Um, I have a try go method uh, saying that which is kind of a method I created to like anything try verb will let you kind of preview that verb and handle it differently. Um, so here it, it handles the, the go command by uh, looking at the direction you're trying to go and checking to see if you've already opened the crate. If you haven't opened the crate, it tells you like, dude, you, you can't do that. Um, and I returned true just to indicate that the, uh, the, that the event was handled and the default behavior should not be implemented. Again, this code is not what I would call ideal by any means, and for especially documentation. Um, but just high level, this is sort of how I'm structuring the world. I have a describe method down here, which is just called whenever you enter the room, uh, just to show you kind of the, the name of it. And, and then I give it some basic information, such as its name and ID. And then I give it a collection of objects. So the crate room has a, a crate object in it. And the object is what you can actually interact with. The room is just really just a kind of a master container for things. Um, side note here, most modern interactive fiction development doesn't do this. Like the, you kind of build your engines for authors. Uh, this is me just tooling around having fun. Um, so typically your, your modern games will look more like a story uh, with some scripting commands than like a actual application. Um, for, for what it's worth, if anyone curious. Um, so kind of taking a look at this crate object and what an object would look like, um, they extend from game object base. They typically take in a room so they know which room they're in. Um, that's relevant because sometimes you have objects that are present in multiple rooms, such as the crate. It's present when you're inside the crate and when you're in the office. So you might be in the office wanting to look at the crate or look at the blanket or something like that. Uh, so this is kind of a little hack for me to be able to accomplish that sort of thing without a whole lot of extra work. Um, so here are I'm kind of configuring the default behaviors for the for the verbs. Um, so I'm describing what it's going to look like, smell like, what happens when you try to push it, um, what happens when you try to lick it, as well as uh, objects that it might contain. So the crate does contain the door, and it does contain contain the blanket. Uh, and each one of these is is its own game object base. Uh, that when the engine is looking, saying, "Okay, well, where am I? What objects are around here? What objects do they have inside of them?" When it's trying to map different nouns to, to different things. So high level, this is sort of what a object in the game would look like. We'll look at the code in a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, I'm using Jest uh, for unit testing. And I actually wrote all my tests before I wrote the content for the story. So I wrote like a test per room. So this is like a, a, the top of a test for uh, the test for the crate room. So here I'm setting up kind of um, default behavior. So I'm creating the story engine. I'm configuring the, the states to making sure that the crate is, is not open. And I'm making sure that the player starts in this room. So I'm def defining the state for each test, really. And then I kind of have navigation uh, different, um, different groups of tests. So here's some tests related to navigation. And I say, like, it should block uh, navigation to the north when the door is closed. So here it's saying engine get response for go north. So if the player typed in go north, here's the response the engine would generate. And now we're expecting things. So we're, we're testing things. We're making assertions about them. So we're expecting the crate to still be closed. And we're expecting the player to still be in the crate. Um, I, I'm still working on my syntax for JavaScript tests. Uh, I'm very good at .NET tests. I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm great at uh, JavaScript tests yet. Uh, so just disclaimer, this is maybe not best practices. Um, this is just my practices. Um, I also wrote some tests just to see like, hey, what's in the room? And then at the bottom, I have like more like specific things. So this is actually what's, what most of my tests look like. Um, so the name is the crate looks unpleasant. So when you type look at crate, you expect the response to contain the string. You do not like it. So this is my way of saying that 
if the player types this, I'm expecting to get some form of a custom response that should look something like this. And this was kind of how I built out my, my, uh, my story content. It's like, okay, well, when you're in here and you try typing rip up the couch or whatever, the response should have that. And most of my tests failed for you know a month until I implemented the actual content for the game. Um, but the benefit of this is that if I ever change like my my dictionaries, so I'm now recognizing a different word a different way, or I add another object to a room, I can really quickly run my unit tests and say, oh, well, because I made this change, you can no longer look at your crate properly. It doesn't understand the crate. Um, so this is a good way for me to tell that I didn't just break everything by making a minor change, um, which is nice. It was also a nice way for me to say, ah, okay, I haven't implemented this room yet. Um, <laughs> I've gotten asked this before. Uh, no, I did not mean name my dog after the testing framework. I could see how you would get that, but no, I did not name. This is actually the only one time that we ever dressed the poor dog up. He hated it, and I feel so bad about it even just looking at this picture. But no, uh, no, more after the clown than the testing framework, but if you know me in my writing, you would ask to. Uh, what's your question when you have a chance? Yeah, what's your question? Uh, what made you choose uh, chest over the default Angular uh, testing frameworks and that is a great question um so i discovered that just had snapshot tests um a year or two ago and snapshot tests basically let you test the state of an object against a known good state i'm not actually doing that in this application but i've loved it in the past and so i'm like i, I whenever i'm doing testing i want to use just instead of jasmine or mocha or anything like that I also think that maybe Jess is maybe a little faster than those other ones, but that might just be my opinion. And know. just as a follow-up, do you just are you just using Jess here for those simple unit tests and not any component testing? That's correct. I'm using Storybook entirely for component testing. I felt my my effort was better on that way. Uh, the testing I've done with Angular and user interfaces has been very slow, and when slow tests don't tend to get run in my experience unless they're part of a CI framework of, of some form. And again, I think that's just maybe some weaker areas on my side on JavaScript testing, um, but there might also be some other truth to that too. Um, so let's talk about the fun stuff. Uh, so actual test text parsing. So uh, we like to say hey, how an input becomes a response. Uh, so it's kind of composed of five different components to it, um, just in terms of taking that input and generating response. So first you have a tokenizer, which is a really fancy word for for um, doing a string split. Uh, so you're taking a sentence and you're breaking it down to, into individual words. Um, that's pretty easy. The next part is pretty hard, which is lexing. So you are taking those individual word tokens and you're defining some meaning from them. You're figuring out what part of speech, speech they are. Um, you know, what is open? What is, uh, what's Frodo? Why did you type Frodo in there? What's Fubar Vaz? You know, like what part of speech is that or could it be because English is tricky, right? Like open could be an adjective and it could be a verb, uh, any number of things. Um, and uh, what I found two years ago was this library called NLP Compromise, um, which is really awesome. Um, check it out at compromise.cool. They, they do a lot of other stuff beyond just identifying words. Um, they're really good for like sentence parsing and paragraph parsing and pulling all the places and names and, and things out of like long pieces of text and they're supposed to do it fast. Uh, so that's the compromise nature of their name. So it's a compromise between performance and accuracy. Uh, they try to be accurate 99% of the time. Two years ago, I said yes to that. Um, looking at it now, I don't think they are. I actually talked with the author earlier this week and he, he indicated that maybe I had found some bugs as far as some of these regression issues that I've had with words not really being identified properly as their as their secondary usages, like open nowadays identified it as an adjective. And it's like, come, no, it can also be a verb. And I have slides from two years ago that say that it, it used to be a verb as well. Um, so that was a negative thing with this, um, but it is a cool thing, and I think they're going to fix that those issues I encountered. Um, but essentially, what you do is you'll type in NLP, which is just their their library after you import it, and you say your command. So in my case, open the door. And then you call, it gives you back an object and on that object is a method called terms list. And if you do that, it spits back um, this, this object that looks like this. 
So it's got your text. Uh, it's got your text in there. And then it's got individual terms. So it breaks each word down into a token with the, with kind of the text you type. So open and tags that could be applied to it. And again, this should be, you know, verb or verb phrase, uh, things like that. Um, it used to also give you like a best guess. So like the most accurate tag, I don't think it does that anymore. Um, it has a pre and a post. Uh, so these are just like characters before and after your word, if you wanted those, uh, I don't really do anything with those, but you call compromise and compromise just really quickly analyzes your input. Um, and once you have this information and you can say, okay, well, this is an adjective, this is a determiner, this is probably a noun, you can start to make some inferences about it. So that's where you actually parse it. Um, so you are now extrapolating relationships between different words. You're trying to figure out the whole sentence of the structure, including whether it's a valid sentence for what we expect. So, okay, this is an adjective, what's it's modifying? Okay, this is, this is an adverb, you know, what, what verbs is associated with? You know, how are these words related? Uh, and you kind of build this graph of your sentence. If you think back to eighth grade and sentence, sentence diagramming, which um, again, nerd, I actually kind of liked. Um, but uh, you have this graph of an object and you can kind of pass that into the rest of your engine. Um, so next you kind of need to be able to interpret things. So uh, I typed in, I might've typed in, you know, turn off the camera. Uh, and the engine would look for a camera. So it's like, okay, camera's a noun. And I don't know why it said it was a verb, sorry, uh, compromise. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you try to map it to something in your world. And so it look at your objects and what synonyms they might have and it'd say, okay, well, camera corresponds to this thing, blanket corresponds to this thing. Um, and it might just say like, okay, I, I can't figure out what you mean by spaceship. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like that's fine. Um, and then you hand it off to some piece of code that's going to execute it. Um, in prior versions of, of, uh, of applications like this, I've made kind of a class per verb handler. I did something a little bit different uh, and more janky this time around, uh, which I'll ashamedly show you in a minute. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a fun hobby project, right? Um, so let's look at a concrete example of this. So let's say that you're typing in open the door using the rusty key. Um, compromise, I feed this to compromise, compromise tokenizes it down to individual words. Okay. Pretty simple. Each word is a word that the user typed in in the sentence in order. Okay. Compromise also lexes it. So it's my, also my lexer. So it, it bolts on little, um, modifiers for each word. Right. Um, and so I, I now know what it thinks about that. So I hand, hand off these, these terms, um, which are terms are a compromised, uh, oh gosh, you got an error talking to compromise. That's uh, maybe appropriate as much as I like them. Uh, Just over HTTP is their okay. website. Okay. <laughs> um, just a side note, uh, I compromise returns, returns a, a term. I like to wrap everything from an external library into a custom object with some convenience methods into it. That way I'm not passing around external code too much throughout my application, even if it's running on under the covers. So if I wanted to move off of NLP compromise to something else, it'd be a little easier for me to do that. So I use a word, uh, sorry, a word where compromise has a term, for example. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to call out to, or I'm gonna parse it. So again, the way I parse is I'm looking for the first verb in the sentence. I'm looking, if I don't find that first word, I'm looking for my other words to see if any of them can act as a verb. Um, I'm also validating that we only have one thing that, that must be a verb uh, and, and that the sentence starts with a verb. So a verb before the noun, things like that. Um, and then you start kind of folding everything else in. So, you know, uh, adjectives are going to go with the next noun. Adverbs are going to go with the verb. Uh, prepositions are going to go with the next, you, you know, things like that. And so you get this kind of visual graph of the sentence, uh, which you can feed into your engine. Um, so Matt, will, yeah. will this work if the user enters like a word salad into the, I mean, let's say it's a, a, an actual sentence, but they've scrambled the words, you know, so that it's, you know. Can you give me an example? Um, so it's like we're using the rusty door key. So it's like using rusty the, the, 
key door, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. Yeah, probably not because I, I am, I try to be strict about that, that first word being a verb. Um, I'm less strict than I was two years ago about that. Cause I, I handled it. I, pa- I parsed it, or passed it off to the appropriate object back in the day. Uh, and now I'm doing a little bit less with that. Um, but I do try to be strict in that sentence structure just to constrain things to a more manageable scope. Uh, maybe one of the few places where I'm good with scope. <laughs> Does that help Paul? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, any other questions, please, please list them, but I'm gonna start showing some of the, some of the code um, in an editor I actually work with a little bit more, uh, which is WebStorm. Um, which does have a nice zoom capability. So really probably the first thing that you'd wanna see is my parse method. So I have a parser which parses text, right? So we give it a text, a piece of text. Uh, The first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna expand shorthand. So in adventure games, you have things like in for north and L for look at and I for inventory and things like that. Um, These are commands that people are familiar with using and uh, they expect to be able to use them. So this is my hack for that. I'm actually modifying the user sentence um, before it gets to, to compromise. So next, like I showed you before, I'm calling out to compromise. Compromise is spitting back a list of terms, uh, which I'm then passing into build sentence, uh, which is a method on my end. Build sentence, uh, it takes in the terms, it spits out a sentence, which is my wrapper object for the entire sentence. Um, I'm doing some fairly ugly things here to just kind of translate from compromise tags to my word objects. Um, we have text and we have reduced. Reduce should take words like um, skiing and turn them into ski. Uh, so really you want to look at reduce instead of text, but text can be helpful for communicating back to the user if there was an issue with it. Um, yeah, this is WebStorm. I, I, I love WebStorm uh, by JetBrains. Um, uh, though VS Code is fantastic as well and uh, significantly more free. Uh, and then I have this adjust tags thing, which is just me adjusting for compromise, you know, not identifying things the way I want them to. So for example, you look at, at verbs, I'm telling it, yeah, open can be a verb. You used to know this. Why don't you know this now? Um, and so this is really just me kind of customizing different tags at a high level. Um, so once that's parsed, uh, it gets fed into a verb handler, which is the class I hate the most uh, and need to refactor the most and likely never will because I'm so done with this project because coronavirus and I want my evenings back. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we call out to get handler and we give it the verb. So the verb associated with that sentence. Um, and it's got some kind of scary return type syntax here, um, which basically tells it that you know it, it may return back a, it, well, it will return back a function that it can call uh, to get a proper response. So here I'm doing some really hideous stuff where I'm mapping different forms of the same verb to a verb handler. Uh, again, don't, don't code like this, please. Uh, this, is, this is not what you should be doing. Uh, but if we go to a, an individual verb like handle bark, um, we see uh, it's not doing a whole lot. It's, um, it's calling out to the handle verb method using a command context, which is really the internal picture of the sentence, the internal picture of the game world, and the ability to output responses, so adding story text and things like that. So I give it the name of the verb to try, uh, and then I give it kind of a response for, like, if the, if the object we're interacting with, if the noun we're interacting with doesn't have a... Uh, smell uh, description associated with it, then, or in this case, bark, then it's going to give you, you glare at it with your fierce and give it your fiercest bark. If you just type bark and you didn't tell it what object you want to bark at, it'll use this one instead. So this is sort of a generic uh, way of handling verbs uh, for me. And, And then if we look at crate door, this might be a little bit more apparent about how this actually works. We're actually looking for little things on there on, on the on the object. So, smell, for example, is the verb that anything smell related maps down to. 
and it it's just gonna return back a string. So this is just the shorthand for me for writing code, so I don't have to write a whole bunch of like functions for everything. It just says like, hey, it th th this thing smells like metal, right? Versus push, push is a lot more interactive, and look is a lot more interactive. Actually, look would be a little bit easier to show. So look, I'm giving it a method. So when you call out to look at something, it's gonna take in the the command context and it's going to check okay is the crate open okay cool well are you inside the crate then it's going to give you a a, a a response just telling you like hey you can get out of the crate now otherwise it's like yeah it's it's open you can go back in if you want um and if the crate's not open then then you give it gives you a little hint that you should probably push this thing um again this is not really something i would try to emulate too much. I'm not that wild about this architecture, but this is taking advantage of some of the more dynamic natures uh, of JavaScript. Um, if I tried to do the same type of thing in .NET, it would have been a lot um, slower because I would have to use reflection and things like that. So JavaScript's openness let me do some interesting things, let's just say. <laughs> um, let's see. Hey, hey Matt. Yeah. So each each room has a has a, a kind of a page uh, just like this with four or five tabs telling it how to how it can interact with everything. Yeah, so each room has a has a room uh, object, so a single file, right? And that's going to give you a list of objects, and those objects have behavior associated with them. And the engine's just trying to figure out how to pipe it to the right verb on the right object. Uh, and then I kind of have these kind of functions which will modify the world. So here we have handle pushed, um, where we say if the crate isn't open, then you push the door and it flies open, you're free. And now we're setting the crate, the, the crate is open and we're increasing our score. High level, that's what we're doing. Um, I feel like I wanted to talk about this file, but I can't remember why. So uh, we'll skip it. Any other questions on on the the code before we get into more of the DevOpsy kind of type of stuff? Okay. Well, I'll have questions at the end as well. So feel free to chime in. Um, maybe one of the things that worked the best with this project was uh, was just actually kind of automating deployment and things like that. Uh, so I mentioned that this is an Angular application. And I mentioned that I separated the front end from the parsing logic. Um, so uh, you know we have kind of like a TypeScript library, right? Well, these are two separate repositories. Both are on GitHub. And uh, the Angular application relies on Node Package Manager to import the TypeScript library. Um, so anytime I need to change my story logic, I need to push up a new uh, version to NPM and then update the Angular application to point at that, that new uh, library. It's a little bit tedious on that front. Uh, I could probably automate that a little bit more, um, but uh, that at least keeps that dependency uh, separate. Uh, question from Doug, is there anything like a use verb so, this, so the user doesn't have to play uh, uh, guess the verb um, like kind of an uh, omni verb of like, hey, I want to use the default interaction with this thing. Uh, no, I didn't implement that, but that's a decent idea. Um, it might be pretty easy to do, actually, if you just say default verb equals chew or something like that or push. But yeah, that's kind of gets back to some of the frustrations with uh, interactive fiction, which is like, okay, what objects do they actually implement that they're describing? What verbs are, are, are supported? If I type in something it's not expecting, how am I going to handle that? Which is part of why I liked compromise because I wouldn't have to build out a dictionary of words and what they mean because English is big and confusing. Um, but uh, getting back to NPM, um, if you're not familiar with the process of pushing to uh, it, pushing a package to NPM, you can actually run a uh, publish command. Uh, so you can you can kind of uh, define a version for your application using uh, package.json as well as like a repository. Uh, and, then, and then you can also just do npm version to uh, update the version. So 
a patch is going to increment the minor or the, the patch version. The minor is going to increment the minor version and reset the patch to zero. And major is going to increment this one and reset the other two to zero. Then npm publish is something that you kind of configure on your own machine for that repository. But you tell it what to publish to, you give it your credentials, et cetera. So I don't have my own authentication um, associated with the project, which is nice for me because I don't want to you know, share that. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it's helpful. Um, uh, so these are, are package files in general. They also have plenty of dependencies. So here I have a dependency on the compromise library to, uh, uh, to, to parse my code. Um, and when I do do my publish, it'll succeed and uh, the library will be present out there on NPM. And you can see this has a whopping 10 downloads per week, which are all me. I'm hopeful of anyway. I can't see what anybody else would be doing with this library. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, so you can write your own TypeScript libraries or JavaScript libraries and push them out to, to NPM, um, which is nice. Um, we also, I also used uh, Travis. So I used Travis CI, which I you know, keep hearing about. This is my first time actually playing with it. So anytime I made a, a commit to my story logic, I wanted all my tests to run uh, so that you know, I can't get away from running my tests because it's going to just error on me if I, if I try it. Um, and so Travis CI, as Travis CI is pretty easy. You give it a Travis file and you tell it what language it's in. So this is a node file and you tell it how to install itself. And then you just tell it what to run to verify that this thing builds. In my case, it's just run the CI step, which maps back to this, which just builds and runs tests. So you shouldn't even need the install. Um, it, Travis will default the install to uh, for almost any language to whatever the standard is, like NPM or, or um, Maven or something like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this is my first time working with it, so I kind of grabbed somebody else's like default implementation. So yeah, you guess you don't even need that. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then it'll tell you like, hey, your build passed or it failed or uh, whatever. Um, and if it, if it passed or failed or it changed status, you'll get an email about it, which is nice too. Because uh, often I'm like, committing and then I'm going upstairs to watch YouTube or something, you know? Um, so like, oh, dang it, what did I do? Um, which is fun. Um, thing I really liked, uh, I tried to get this thing set up using Azure uh, to, to, to kind of host the static files. Um, I think Microsoft actually just announced today Azure static websites, uh, which would have been ideal for this project. Um, but I was frustrated with Azure's static hosting and I wound up going with Netlify. So anytime I make a commit on my Angular repository, Netlify will watch it and it'll see it on that master branch and it'll say, okay, well, you, you just released a new version of this thing. Okay, uh, you've given me access to doggoquest.com. All right, I'm going to go replace your existing version with a new version of this thing. Um, and, and all I'm have to do for that is I'm just like, hey, here's the repository to watch, you know, wh when you want to build, just run npm run build and look for the output files in this directory uh, relative to the, to the project. And um, that was really seamless. I really didn't have to do a whole lot of extra work. And then, you know, boom, dogs. Because, yeah, that's a fun sentence to use. Um, and, and on the testing front, like, I wrote a lot of tests, but I can't anticipate what people are going to say. And so I hooked everything up to Google Analytics as well, so that when people type in commands, it's giving me kind of like what room they were in and what they tried to type. Um, I would show you this, but I've seen the things that people type into this, so I'm not going to show you that today. <laughs> um, it's so violated. <laughs> I'll show you a, uh, a sanitized version, let's say. Um, so we can kind of see, you know, the users in the crate and they're typing in bark at the squirrel, or they're trying to do this, you know, lick, lick paw. Oh, I don't support that. Well, enough people are trying to do this thing, you know, like there's three people trying to look around in the crate. I should probably support that. Or they're going south in the entryway or whatever. You know, so this is kind of a, a way of reacting to user behavior um, and adapting your stories. And of course, this is a project I abandoned, so it's sort of meaningless. Um, but it's, it's something I would definitely recommend considering for something that you could have a wide variety of user input uh, for. Um, so just kind of winding down, um, what worked well? 
jazz testing worked really well. Uh, I could have done the same thing in Jasmine, uh, but uh, the, te the test based approach worked really well on my end for making sure I didn't make any mistakes uh, as I changed things to support new things. Um, external libraries like Storybook and Angular Material worked very, very well for me. Um, adding on Netlify and Travis worked extremely well. NPM worked okay. Um, the one downside with NPM was that, you know, when I pushed up a new version, like if I made a change to the story, I couldn't really do any ad hoc testing. I didn't have a way of typing in commands other than writing a new test for it. So I couldn't just move myself to a room and try to type in things. I probably could have found a solution to that, um, but I didn't really want to put a user interface in my application or maybe even a web server or something like that. So my way of testing it was to write unit tests and then publish it and then install the new version and then test it like that locally, uh, which took about five minutes per iteration, which is enough to discourage you from trying to do it. Uh, I mentioned losing energy and interest in the project. You know, life changes sometimes dramatically. Um, that definitely didn't work well. Uh, I tried to limit scope, but I, <laughs> I, I really should have halved what I was trying to do. Um, and then compromise just didn't come through for me the way that I, I remember it doing in the past. And again, I think it's due to that one bug, which should be fixed this week. Um, but that was a disappointment. And it took some wind out of my sails and made my job a little harder and made my, my code a little uglier. Um, so my encouragement for you with side projects is, you know, if you have time for one, pick something that's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to serve some form of a purpose. Um, that could be learning a new technology. It could be giving you an outlet for, you know, having fun coding. It could be building a portfolio for getting hired somewhere, trying something out that you might want to introduce to your team. Um, and a side project should be something that you're okay to walk away from at any point in time, you know? It's it's there to serve you, not there to own you uh, necessarily. Uh, so that that would be my encouragement as someone who's probably walked away from 125 at least uh, side projects over my uh, uh, life so far. Uh, aiming for 500, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, my wife insisted that I add in a slide for this. So uh, if you like my dog, if you think he's cute, he's got a Twitter account. Uh, so <laughs> follow Jester Doggo on Twitter. Um, probably he'll get more follows out of this talk than I will. That's okay. Um, any final questions? I have some links at the bottom for both of my repositories. The repository from two years ago, which I view is better than what I demoed today. That's Angular IF. Um, and then uh, the links to compromise my writing, and then you know obviously Doggo Quest. So, uh, what questions do we have today? I've got a question. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that um, each one of your um, TypeScript classes are in a separate file. Yes. Um, and now I come, uh, I come from a, a Java background, mm -hmm. and uh, we pretty much just use JavaScript procedurally, so there's just one, one big file, and most of the heavy work was done on the back end in Java. So I'm not familiar with uh, how you do things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to owe Java, but yeah, did, how, because you don't want to send 50,000, well, you didn't have that many classes. You don't want to send a hundred different files, one for each class to your client. So how's that packaged up? Well, um, Angular again is, is a uh, very opinionated. So it relies on uh, Webpack uh, at the Angular level to kind of roll everything up into a single minified file or maybe little minified bundles if you split your application into the, into bundles. So it's kind of doing all that minification and bundling for you into a small JavaScript file. Uh, on the TypeScript library side, um, it's up to me running TSC, a uh, TypeScript compiler, to generate my files. Um, I believe I did some form of minification. I, I moved it all into a single file. Um, but uh, it wasn't really a huge focus for me as just a hobby project. But you can do the same thing uh, using TSC if you wanted to. So using um, TypeScript with Angular, does it kind of uh, encourage you to um, have each class in, in a separate file? Yeah, um, it, that's part of their opinions. Um, and and I, that that's very palatable for me as a .NET guy because we, we do like different classes in, in, in individual files. 
Um, uh, but yeah, they do they do by default put things into a different file just for maintainability. It's it's often good for source control as well, so you have fewer merge merge conflicts and things like that. I think the um, only times I I really share have multiple exports per JavaScript or TypeScript file, or if they're really related, or if I have, and especially with Angular, if I had a component that used that had this very specific interface that was extending jQuery and I wanted to type it, I might just localize it to that component mm. um, and have a, another export. But generally with, with the way, that, you know, with what Matt said, with the way that the opinions are in Angular, it's, for, it's pushing you towards that direction. Yeah, pretty strongly. But it's it's not going to, I don't think it's going to yell too hard if you if you try to resist it. You can certainly do private classes inside of the same file and things like that. But your major things, they do want you to have them in, a, in individual files. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Java was a little bit more that way too. And then you'd jar stuff up or war files or ear files. Hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. It, I was going to say, there's nothing on Zoom yet, so yeah. <laughs> on Twitch yet, so yeah. Um, um, sorry, Joel. So, it seemed, do you think it would have defeated the purpose and not been like that kind of classic games org that you liked, if you just kind of had a drop down menu and and let them choose certain things, certain actions, and like, oh, if you want to choose this verb, then you can do this, and then you wouldn't have had to go through all the headache of using NLP compromise and having to associate words and all that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Yes, it would be significantly easier for me to do it that way. Um, it, it, but it, I was actually looking at that kind of an approach two years ago. I didn't really consider it for this project, but I did that two years ago where I was looking at it anyway. Okay. You, um, as someone starting out, do you think it'd be, that would be if I like, if someone starting out wanted to do some a project similarly, do you think you would suggest kind of doing that approach to just simplify things? Yeah, if you're starting out, build something small. Um, it was hard for teenage Matt to fail projects that he couldn't have no chance of succeeding and uh, ambition way bigger than his capabilities. But each project that I built and failed at taught me how not to build a project. Right? It, it taught me how to like the pains of various architectural choices. Um, and I think that's important as long as you're okay with that uh, mentally and emotionally. So uh, drop downs, yes, absolutely. Starting out as a beginner, uh, use your inputs, you know, just constrain your scope, make it choose your own adventure. So you give the user like three or four options. Um, Twine is very good for that. Um, but this is just me kind of fooling around, having fun and, and sharing it a little bit. What's and, Twine? Sorry, I, I'm yeah, not sure what that is. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Twine is sort of a, a graphical way of building interactive choose your own adventure style stories. So you're not typing in things, you're getting a blurb of text and getting a few options. Um, it, it integrates well with games as well. So there are actually things on Steam that are powered by Twine. I think around the world in 60 days uh, is, is one of those or 90 days, um, which is really interesting. Um, but that's a very good way of constraining your scope. You still have all the content to create and probably more of it if you're just doing something story-based. Um, but uh, technically it's a lot less interesting too. Is there, I mean, is there still like good, a good amount of code that you have to write or is it just, just try and just take all the hard part out and just have to make content? Um, I, would, um, I would imagine there's a decent bit of code you have to write, but... Uh, I, I've never tried, I've never been inclined. I'm, I'm too much of the, I hate myself and I'm going to have to parse English for this. Cause that's what, that's what's interesting to me, right? I think the key principle here is begin with the end in mind. Yeah. And if your goal is to make a game, then try a few other similar games and see how their interfaces work. Whereas if you really wanted to play around with natural language processing, then go for the natural language processing and, and see what you can do with it. Um, mm. This is me revisiting my childhood and having fun with modern skills and modern technologies on ancient problems. Well, cool. Uh, Guy, thank you in the user group for having me and for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. You know, we're all around our house and more time on the couch, uh, but I appreciate your time and interest. 
Yeah. Uh, is there, Hey Matt, is there anything uh, you'd like to plug that you're working on or doing or that? Um, um, if you are very interested in hiring junior talent, I have some very good people to recommend. So uh, uh, give me a, give me a, 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 a message on at Matt at kill all defects or integer man. And I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with some very talented people either just graduated or graduate in a few months. Um, but uh, no, I'm, uh, if you're ever interested in anything more on software quality, um, you can check me out at killalldefects.com. Um, since coronavirus, I really haven't been writing very much at all. I've just not had the mental headspace for it. Um, but I hope to get back to that at some point. Um, and if there's anything you'd like to hear me write about in software careers or, or quality, I'd love to hear it. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, that was a very excellent and, and it was very fun, <laughs> informative. It's it's uh, it was rich, full of uh, like uh, here's a thing to go check out. Here's a good thing to go check out. It's full of uh, of uh, markers for people to who are learning to go out and dig deeper. Dig deeper. And it was uh, very very well executed. So uh, fantastic okay. job. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, yeah, last call for questions on Zoom or I mean Zoom, not not on Zoom on Twitch. Uh, if not, then uh, we're going to shut the uh, the Twitch session down. If you want to join us on Zoom, we're going to hang out here afterwards. Uh, the link to uh, the Zoom is in uh, in meetup.com. If you go to columbusjs.org, there'll be a link to this meetup. And you what's, can uh, what's next month? What we uh, got? That's actually what I was just going to say next. Uh, next month and coming up here, let me share my screen. Um, let's see if that works. Can you all see? my browser yeah well almost okay there we go see it now I, i'm looking at the the stream so excellent we can see it. okay so uh this is uh, obviously this is uh what we just saw here right <laughs> building an interactive uh, fiction game in modern javascript um you should go to that talk it was it's really good <laughs> uh next month we have jackie gleason he's going to be presenting on robotics and node which honestly is one of my favorite topics is uh, combining electronics and JavaScript. Uh, there's just a lot of fun potential in that uh, topic. And so uh, that should be fun. I don't know if he's going to actually show some uh, electronics and if he is how he's planning on doing that. So I'm curious to see that. I need to follow up with him and see if he's going to have like a camera and, and how he wants to do that. Uh, in July, uh, we've got Justin James coming in. Uh, he's not coming in. He's in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and he's going to be giving a talk on Cypress. Uh, where automated web UI tests isn't just for QA anymore. So uh, that's July. Um, being virtual has actually made it a lot easier to find speakers. I'm, I'm actually booked all the way through December now, um, but I don't have it all updated yet. Um, but in August, we have Ryan Lancio uh, speaking about you might not need Webpack. Uh, and he's, um, if uh, we're in a Corona-free zone at that point, he may come down to Columbus because he's just up in Ann Arbor. Uh, but so we've got several talks lined up. They look really good. Uh, and um, yeah, so there's a lot going on. Um, so hey, guy, one final note. Um, I will be posting my slides on LinkedIn and Twitter tonight. Uh, if you were interested in having those for reference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, some comments on Twitch. Uh, thank you, Matt. No questions. Just thank you and applause. So uh, everyone uh, had a good time uh, on Twitch. Well, uh, three people ha I can confirm had a good time on Twitch. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, uh, John, um, you sent me, um, uh, he smiled. So uh, I think he probably had a good time too. <laughs> uh, but they're still hanging out and watching. So that's good. That's a good sign. Uh, but that's what we got coming up. So we got a lot of good coming talk coming up. If uh, you know anyone's interested in speaking, of course, uh, let me know. Uh, you know, if, if things stay virtual a long time, uh, maybe we'll do a JavaScript meetup uh, twice a month uh, if there's enough interest and demand. Uh, and um, and don't feel restricted uh, by geography. So if you know someone that's out of town and wants to come and watch, I mean, it's called Columbus JS, but it doesn't, you don't have to be from Columbus to attend. So um, let's, let's get it out there and um, bring people in from all over. Um, maybe, maybe we can take it from Columbus JS to being, uh, I don't know, what's the plural of Columbus? Columbi? <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to, to bring people in. Uh, just out of curiosity, is, is anyone uh, here from out of town? um on um on the zoom i don't think on the zoom but or on the on twitch I'll, I'll give about three or four seconds here for lag uh if anyone's coming in from outside of columbus yeah 
Okay. Well, we'll see them when they come through. So uh, again, uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for attending. I'm going to go ahead and shut the Zoom down now. Um, or not the Zoom, the Twitch. <laughs> I keep getting that backwards. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, okay. Hang on. How do I do that? I need to stop sharing my screen. I don't, I don't have the little, uh, God, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Normally you have like that little uh, green thing that pops down that says stop sharing. And uh, that's gone. Technology is hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not it. That's not it. So we can still hang out and talk out. <laughs> Hey, uh, hey, 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 Matt. Just know that we're on Twitch. <laughs> hey, Matt. Yeah, Joel. How, can we, is your game online? Can we play it? Yeah, or? just go out to dogglequest.com. You're going to be disappointed. It doesn't do a whole lot, but it it's, it's how, interesting. I mean, I'm not saying how long I'm going to play it. I might just try it out. And, and if it really is interesting to you for whatever reason, you want to send me a pull request, I'll likely accept it if it's fine, you know. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't recommend wasting your time on that. Can right. I send you a pull Literally. request with no tests or anything like that? Just you can. You can absolutely send me that pull request. And you can, you can absolutely reject it, right? Uh, I'll just leave it open for a few years and then close it. Yeah. No Very interestingly, I've been working on uh, for a client, like breaking up and you know lexing sentences and mm. and and being able to pull apart. And making the sentence interactive this is for education. So like teaching grammar basically, and you know it's really hard work to to write a lecture and and this is not even a I mean it's not even doing natural language processing which is even harder. So just just the basic stuff and and uh, yeah quotation marks and getting the right thing going down for like okay I need to like take the I need to normalize and then I need to denormalize back into a sentence like actual text so that I can compare it to the right answer and that is that's hard mm. it is really hard that's that's why I opted out of it and let compromise do the hard work yeah what do you mean by um natural language is that you mean like speech is speech speech I would imagine would be way harder uh, I'll let Matthew answer that question I think he's more familiar with it than I am just judging by his answer mm. I mean, I, I, I think you're more familiar with it, actually. I, I handle text processing. I don't handle like, uh, uh, like textual analysis or anything like that. So you can look at sentiment and you're know, trying to figure out like what the user is thinking. Uh, you see that a lot in like comment analysis on bulletin boards and things like that. Yeah, like the, from my understanding, just you know, what, what we talked about natural language NLP, anyways, is, is being able to break down the parts of sentences and. And and what like that API is doing, saying here's a verb or whatever. So, um, you know, a big tool nowadays that that uses NLP is Alexa and uh, Google, whatever the dot or whatever. I don't know what Google Voice or whatever uh, Siri. They, they're all using NLP to take in from a voice standpoint, and but it's basically doing the same thing. Um, you know, as you do with text here you're um, interpreting and parsing text. Yeah, but you're par parsing like phonemes and sounds like has to kind of, it doesn't it doesn't spell it out the way like we spell out words in English. It spells it out as as we hear them. So like phonetically. English is is off. <laughs> <laughs> And like if you if you think about like how dictionaries, how you can form a dictionary and how spell check works. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, if you think about how spell check works, you have to actually limit. There's a point where you can't get accurate spell check when you include in all the possible words in the English language, um, just because it's so complex. Yeah. In fact, the original Zork games and, and games of that era, they would only take pay attention to the first three letters of any word, uh, just just due to the size of their dictionaries and how they implemented things. So, like. It was very dumb in how it handled things. <laughs> well, cool. These have been good questions. We're still actually on Twitch. I haven't shut it down yet because we were just having such a great conversation and it was topical. But um, and if we want to continue on, I'm happy to leave the stream running. Um, but if uh, people want to get off, uh, 
of Twitch, I'm happy to do that too. So uh, what, what do you, what's everyone's thoughts? You the boss, man, I don't care. Okay. okay, well, I'm gonna go and shut down the Twitch stream then and uh, we'll hang out here and, uh, and, and talk bad about all those Twitch people. <laughs> of course. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Twitch. everyone, for tuning in via Twitch. Again, if you want to join us on Zoom, uh, go to uh, columbusjs.org, and uh, there's a link. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, have a good evening, everyone.